Well, thank you for coming and listening to, to my talk today about uh, dinosaurs and some of the other creatures that lived uh, uh, during the Cretaceous period. Um, I'm going to talk about um, not only dinosaurs but other creatures and from Australia and overseas and also what we paleontologists do when we go out in the field uh, looking for these uh, creatures. Um, 66 million years ago something really bad happened to our planet. A huge uh, asteroid or possibly a big comet slammed into our planet and as a result there was a huge dust cloud thrown into the atmosphere that spread all the way around the globe and uh, sunlight was um, largely blocked out for maybe up to 10 years. You can imagine the effect that had on, on plants initially and then on any, anything that sustained themselves on plants. Uh, as a result the, the plant-eating dinosaurs died out and uh, the meat-eating dinosaurs, of course, they starved to death. And not only were the dinosaurs affected, but many other groups, uh, about half of all the species of fish in the oceans went extinct. The uh, flying reptiles, the pterosaurs went extinct, and, and many groups were really hit very hard. Um, the Cretaceous greenhouse world, that's often a, a term you hear when you listen about the Cretaceous. The Cretaceous is the last, the third uh, stage of the three periods that commonly is known as the age of the dinosaurs. We have the Triassic, 250 to 200 million years, then the Jurassic period, uh, up until about 145 million years ago, and then Cretaceous from 145 to 66 million years ago. So why is it called the greenhouse world? Well, if you, if you have a greenhouse and you're really serious about it, if you want to maximize the size of your vegetables and shorten the time it takes for them to, you know, ready to be harvested, one thing you do is you crank up the carbon dioxide. You elevate the carbon dioxide in the greenhouse to about 1,500 parts per million. Uh, today we have about 400 parts per million. And 1,500 parts per million is approximately though the CO2 levels we had during the middle part of the Cretaceous period. Now, one thing about the, the age of the dinosaurs, as many of these dinosaurs were very, very large. Now, why, how come they could grow to such an enormous size? It could be that they, uh, they could be related to the very high levels of CO2, because when you crank it up in a greenhouse, plants would grow faster. So that might explain why some of these dinosaurs were so large. More food for the plant-eating dinosaurs. Um, if we go back in time, let's say 100 million years ago, um, the planet was very different. It was much warmer than it is today, and this, the carbon dioxide levels were very, very high. It is probable also that the oxygen levels were much higher as well because if, if plants grow faster and, and uh, uh, green algae in the water grow faster, as a byproduct of the photosynthesis, they'll produce more oxygen. So the oxygen level rises. So for example, if that was a wildfire during the Cretaceous period, it's likely that it was more intense than it would have been today. So where did all this carbon dioxide come from? Um, it came from volcanic activity. Um, the globe is made up of about 12 big plates and a, a number of smaller plates. And these plates, they move around relative to each other all the time. Australia, for example, we are heading north by about five to 10 centimeters per year. It's a slow but steady process. And at times during the history of our planet, uh, the average velocity of these plates might have been higher or lower. When they speed up, which seems to have been the case during the Cretaceous period, you will get more volcanism simply. So that's why we had higher levels, or that's why I believe we have the higher levels of, of carbon dioxide during the Cretaceous period. Now one of the effects being a greenhouse gas is that it raised the temperature. So we got a, a major sea level rise. When you raise the temperature, water will get warmer and it will expand in itself. But also, if you have a lot of volcanism on the seafloor, there's going to be a lot of 
new, what we call, oceanic crust. It takes a while for that to cool down and contract, so it's going to be quite fluffy and a larger volume, so that helped pushing up the, the water onto the uh, continents. So during the middle Cretaceous, sea levels might have been as much as 150 meters higher than, the, than they are today. So the continents were highly fragmented, leaving many of these dinosaur populations isolated. Here we have a, a graph showing the climate and the temperature over the last 500 million years. And we can see that during the Cretaceous period, especially during the middle Cretaceous, it was very, very warm compared to today when we have, we are sort of still in an ice age period, uh, geologically speaking. The last time we had an ice age was during the Carboniferous Permian boundary here, when we had huge ice sheets on Gondwana, the ancient supercontinent. <clears throat> I'm not sure if any of you have seen the, uh, there's a dinosaur movie, I saw it going up to Karatha just a few days ago, walking with dinosaurs. Um, anyway, that took place here along the um, eastern shore of Laramidia, which was a large island that formed in North America. And you can see how high the sea level was during the Cretaceous period. So North America turned into a, a, a fragmented, almost like an archipelago. Europe certainly was, formed an archipelago uh, during the late Cretaceous. <coughs> That's just setting this scene. So we have very high sea levels, quite not much land exposed. Today is about 29%. During the mid-Cretaceous, it was 19% was land, but the rest was ocean. Um, <clears throat> but one of the most interesting aspects working on dinosaurs um, is how we relate birds to dinosaurs. Um, if you read a scientific publication published, let's say, 40 years ago, here is one published in the American Naturalist. It says, giant dinosaurs <coughs> dominated the Mesozoic era. It's quite clear cut. If you read a modern paper like this one published by um, paleontologists, including Australian paleontologists, critical reassessment of the Cretaceous non-avian dinosaur fauna. What's a non-avian dinosaur? If there are non-avian dinosaurs, that implies there must be avian dinosaurs. There is an avian dinosaur. Ever since about 20, 30 years ago, especially over the last two, two decades, paleontologists working on, on, on dinosaurs, they all regard birds not only as closely related to dinosaurs, but as one of different dinosaur groups. So they talk about tyrannosaurs is one group, uh, the horned triceratops types is another one, you have the, the sauropods and you have the birds. So birds are essentially dinosaurs. And how do we know that? Um, I'm sure you've seen, most of you would have seen, if possibly all of you have seen, the Jurassic Park movies. Now this is how uh, Velociraptor um, was portrayed. It's a very vicious animal, so you can see that huge claw they had on the second toe. But the skin is very reptile-like. However, that, that turns out to be all wrong, and how do we know that? Well, over the last 20-odd years, there's been absolutely fantastic dinosaur fossils being found in China. In ancient lakes, a system of lakes in eastern China that formed around um, uh, 120 million years ago. Now these lakes were surrounded by uh, plenty of volcanoes and at times there was a major volcanic eruption, a lot of ash fall and dinosaurs died and, and drowned if they walk in uh, near the lake and that very fine ash uh, cloud would preserve these dinosaurs in great details. And it turns out that all the raptor dinosaurs that's been found in these Chinese deposits, those that are well enough to preserve, they all have feathers. Every one of them have feathers. They have feathers on their, on their arms, and some even have feathers on their legs. Some of them could sort of glide from one tree to another. Very, very bird-like. And other features that were thought to be unique to birds is the wishbone, for example, where even T-Rex has a wishbone. So many of these characters, one by one, they've been shown to be widespread among the meat-eating dinosaurs. Look at that big, massive claw on the finger. And this is the uh, 
Latin genus name of, of that creature. Anyone can figure out what finger this belongs to. It has such a big whopping claw. It's an emu. Did you know emus have claws bigger than a cat? Next time you use, if you sadly enough come across a dead emu, check out the fingers. And emus belong to a group of birds that are close, the closest living relatives to, to the uh, non-avian dinosaurs. Here's another fantastic fossils coming out from China, Microraptor, that's the smallest raptor dinosaur. And you can see big feathers, both on its arms and its legs. And not only do we know that these raptors had feathers, we also know in many cases what color they had. How do we know that? Well, it turns out when we put the feathers under a high-powered microscope, we could see that the pigment, pigmentation cells were still preserved. So Microraptor, for example, we know it was blue, blackish, uh, and, and many, some of the other raptor dinosaurs had bright red, all sorts of colors, just like uh, modern uh, birds or avian dinosaurs, as we call them. Uh, during the age of the dinosaurs, from Triassic all the way to the end of the Cretaceous, uh, there were mammals around as well. Uh, certainly when you get into the Jurassic Cretaceous, then uh, what we call proper mammals. Uh, but one feature about these mammals is they were all tiny during these, what we call the age of the dinosaurs. The biggest might have been the size of a Tasmanian devil, but most of them were big as a mouse or a rat. And that indicates that there was a tremendous predation pressure on these mammals. Once they reached a certain size, they were just picked off maybe by the raptor dinosaurs. So there must have been something that gave the, the meat-eating dinosaurs uh, a competitive advantage over the mammals. Now what could that have been? Well, you, one can only speculate. If you look at birds' lungs, for example, they are very different from those of the mammals. We have squishy lungs, so we inhale, and the air goes in, and when we breathe out, it goes out again. Whereas birds, they have very stiff lungs, and then they have a set of huge air sacs. So when they breathe in, the air goes to the back end of the body into big air sacs, and then it's squished through the lungs into another set of air sacs, and then the air goes out. So the air goes is a one-way system. It's a far more effective system of extracting oxygen. And birds, they need a lot of oxygen uh, when they fly. And we, we think that the dinosaurs had the same type of very effective uh, lungs. And that could explain perhaps why they had this tremendous um, advantage over the mammals. So imagine these velociraptor dinosaurs, for example, these vicious animals with enormous stamina. That would be the scary thing if you were a little mammal. And here is the uh, uh, illustration of the North American equivalent of velociraptor, Solonitolestes, has caught one of these poor little uh, mammals. The mammals probably were nocturnal, so they were probably out uh, during the dark. And we can see some of the small plant-eating dinosaurs were probably also nocturnal, uh, and they dug burrows uh, because they had big eyes, indicating they were active mostly at night. So this is how we actually classify dinosaurs these days. You have the Ornithischian dinosaurs, which are all plant-eating, and these are all the Saurischian dinosaurs. So you can see here the birds are deeply nested within the dinosaur tree. So it's not a group separate from the dinosaurs. They are present here deep within the dinosaur. So birds are essentially dinosaurs. Now, when I give talk, um, people in general, they tend to be very interested about dinosaurs, especially the meat-eating dinosaurs. I'm just going to mention a little bit about some of these, what do you call them, the theropods, the meat-eating dinosaurs. Now, this is the biggest of all the meat-eating dinosaurs, Spinosaurus. And I presume most of you have already seen our animatronic Spinosaurus, which is a life-size, 14 meters long. Now, the interesting thing about Spinosaurus is that it was actually a fish eater. The jaws had the same shape as those of a crocodile, especially <coughs> the, the strictly fish eating crocodiles. And of course, it had this huge sail here that we're not quite sure what they used it for. Maybe to regulate its body heat, or maybe they, it acted as a support for, for a buildup of fat that they could use during starvation. That's possible. Um, Spinosaurus could grow to maybe 12, 13, 14, possibly 15 meters in length. And Carcharodontosaurus, which lived in the same area in northern Africa 100 million years ago, was very similar in size. 
Um, this looks very much like a T-Rex, but it's not closely related to the Tyrannosaurs. The Tyrannosaurs, they were still around at this time, but they were quite small, maybe just a couple of meters tall. But once these, the big Carcharodontosaurus and, and the Spinosaurus went extinct, the Tyrannosaurs started to increase in size. And here we have the skull of a T-Rex. And so all these three types, you have the Spinosaurids, the Carcharodontosaurus of the mid Cretaceous, and then the late Cretaceous Tyrannosaur, they all seem to be about the same size. That seems to be sort of the practical upper limit for these meat-eating dinosaurs, around 12 to maybe 14 meters. So how come we don't have a 28-meter Tyrannosaur? Well, if you, if you scale something up so it, it increases by a factor of two, the, the length, the weight will actually increase by a factor of eight, so it will be eight times heavier, but the strength of the bones and the muscles will only increase by a factor of four which is, if you, if you scaled up a cricket so it weighed a ton, it wouldn't be able to move at all. So it can only jump due to that effect. Um, so that's why little insects, they, are very, they can sort of drag things that are very heavy. They can jump up many times their, their body weight, whereas, whereas an elephant cannot. Another thing with T-Rex, a scary thing with T-Rex, if you, if you compare what they have, they're trying to figure out how strong the jaws were compared to the, for example, the Carcharodontosaurus, which were of the same size, and T-Rex jaws would have been at least twice as strong, if not three times as strong. So they had tremendous biting power. They could literally crush the bones. And if you've gone through the, the animatronic dinosaur gallery, you've seen there is one of the labels talk about the, the T-Rex poo they found, a big seven kilograms big poo. They had big chunks of of crushed uh, dinosaur bones in it. So T-Rex had a, a bone crushing uh, bite, very, very powerful jaws. And some recent studies on T-Rex and it's one of its most common prey, Triceratops, indicate that after killing Triceratops, it literally ripped the head off in one go to get to the neck muscles. Probably just pinned the, the body with its big foot and then just tore the head off. Pretty brutal animals, these. Uh, an interesting thing with T-Rex, if you look at the growth curve, which they have figured out by cutting cross-section of the leg bone, it seems that the T-Rex had a, a, a growth spurt between you know, 5 to 15 years, where it grew very fast. And then it reached maturity around 20 years. And after it had reached maturity, on average, they only seemed to have lived for another maybe 5 years. So they had a very, very tough life. Uh, many of the skulls, if not most of the skulls of T-Rex, have bite marks from other Tyrannosaurs. And imagine if you're, going, if you're going to go get your lunch and you have to go and kill a Triceratops. It's sort of dangerous business. And here is Triceratops. You can see those huge horns. Uh, Triceratops and T-Rex, they were some of the very last non-avian dinosaurs that lived around 66 to 68 million years ago in Africa. Not only did we have really large dinosaurs, we had some pretty huge crocodiles, and we do have one Danosuchus crocodile upstairs, a model, animatronic model, and this is the skull of Danosuchus, and that was a dinosaur-eating crocodile, uh, closely related to alligators, and it lived in North America. Uh, we haven't found any really large Cretaceous crocodiles in Australia, but that might be just a matter of time. Uh, since they are finding lots of dinosaurs and other creatures from the age of the dinosaurs, particularly in Queensland, in the Winton Formation. Um, as a paleontologist, uh, it's fantastic giving talks. That's one of the most fun things to do. But sometimes you go out in the field, and that's also very fun. And uh, people in general probably don't have a full understanding of how we go about finding uh, dinosaur fossils. One of the first things we do, if there's an area we've never worked on before, we try to get hold of as much as has been published about it as possible. Typically, you start at any publication by the Geological Survey, because they go out and they survey the ground. So they will know if there is rocks of the Cretaceous period, whether they were laid down in, in a river, for example, or if they are marine. Now, this is a type of rock that's called badlands. As a paleontologist, you would call them good lands. Bad lands imply that there's not much growing on it. There's, the, erosion is very, the erosion rate is very high. But obviously, if you don't have vegetation covering the ground, it's much easier to actually find fossils. 
Now this is an ant hill. It turns out that there is a type of ant, uh, certainly in North America, it might be present elsewhere as well. And if they built their nest, for example, out in a badland area, where there might be thin beds, what we call bone beds, that there might be lots of little, uh, for example, at the base of an ancient river channel, you can get an accumulation of little fragments of bones, maybe little teeth of raptor dinosaurs. If that's anywhere near where the ants have decided to build their ants' nest, that might be the only big suitable particles around. So they will go to that outcrop, they will drag that little fossil and use it to build their ants' nest. So what do you do if you're a paleontologist? Well, one thing, you can crawl across the outcrop. I, I mean, you can walk across the outcrop to find these big bones, but that's usually not what we do. First, we want to see if there is any uh, potential of bones to be preserved at all. So we look for these little tiny bones. So a colleague of mine and, and myself, we went to Wyoming, would have been late in 1990s, and we came across these ant hills on, on dinosaur, in dinosaur country. So we brought out our calico bags and we gently removed a big chunk of these ant hills. Now how do you extract the fossils out of the ant hills? Well, we took them back to our hotel uh, because there is not much else to do in the evening and then was the man still had the problem, how do we get the fossils out of this ant hill material? Because the ants were still there, they were very aggressive. We got bitten quite, quite a bit. So, so we brought out the uh, uh, heavy artillery. Poor ants, I still feel bad about it. But they did it for, for the science. So. Now, the best way, the most gentle way of extracting small fossils out of a sandstone or an ant hill is to what we call wet civets. You have sieves and then you sieve it in some body of water. And a bathtub will actually work. It will work for a while. <laughs> because we have vast quantities of this ant hill material. So eventually they, they literally, and this is, this is a true story, the whole bathtub became clogged. So what do you do? You're going to find another, <laughs> another motel with an even fancier bathtub. <laughs> So, and again, it's a true story, but don't tell anyone. We left a trail of destruction through, throughout Wyoming and Montana. Uh, but we got out some fantastic material. And here, is, here it is. These are some of the small fossils. We call them microfossils. And each one of these fossils were initially collected by an ant in Wyoming. Can you believe that? For example, we have, you see those serrated teeth? They are from a dinosaur called Saunitolestis, which is the North American equivalent of Velociraptor. So you have little ants walking about, oh, there's a raptor tooth, let's take that one and drag it back to, to the nest. Um, here we have uh, crocodile teeth. We got uh, plenty of teeth from rays and sharks, and I also found a few teeth of birds, because during the Cretaceous period, many of the birds still had teeth or what we call the avian dinosaurs. So birds progressively lost their teeth over a 70 million year period. And another interesting thing about this assemblage, apart from being all collected by ants, is that it, it, it's a mix of animals that lived on land, like the raptor dinosaurs, and animals that lived in rivers, uh, like the sawfish. And there's, this, there's the tooth of a pike dogfish shark they don't really go up in rivers, they live in the, in the sea. So why do you get this mix of these different animals? Um, well, this was a floodplain environment quite close to the shore. And if you imagine over hundreds of thousands of years, the sea level will fluctuate maybe up to 10, 20 meters. So when the sea level rises, the sea level, what we call transgresses, and it will rework the floodplain sediment. And that's how you often get a mix, mixing of animals, of remains from animals that lived on land and in the ocean. But these are all now in the collections of the WA Museum, and again I thank the ants. So most of the raptor dinosaur teeth that I have were collected by ants initially. 
Um, one thing people are also interested in when I give talks is, well, all right, it's fantastic to hear about all these stories about North American dinosaurs and African dinosaurs, but what about Australia? Where can I find dinosaurs in Australia? Um, Non-avian dinosaurs. Avian dinosaurs, you can just go outside and they're everywhere. 10,000 species of avian dinosaurs. Uh, in Western Australia, the by far best locality for dinosaurs is up in the Broome Sandstone, where we have more than um, 100 kilometers of trackways along the coast. But when it comes to bones, Western Australia is probably one of the worst places on the planet. We have only four bones that are definitely dinosaur bones. Um, two of them are from Geraldton, in the, from the Jurassic. We've got one single toe bone uh, from Jinjin, the mole carpel quarry. And we've got another theropod uh, tail vertebra from Calbarian. That's it. But the really good sites in Australia are down here in Victoria, where they found polar dinosaurs because this area was very close to the South Pole 120 million years ago, and above all, Winton in Queensland. They're finding so many dinosaurs there, so they're digging them up as we speak. Um, they, they have dinosaur digs going on almost all the time. There's so many dinosaurs, they've built a dinosaur museum up there. Um, one of the reasons why it's quite difficult to find dinosaur bones in, in Western Australia is the lack of clear, good outcrops. This is a photograph of a site in Canada called the Dinosaur Provincial Park. You can see the very extensive outcrops, whereas this is me looking for dinosaurs near Mora, and the, usually the, the outcrops are very small, so that just makes it harder to find it. Also, the weathering is quite intense because the, the rock in Western Australia had been sitting quite close to um, sea level for tens of millions of years. So the, the weathering tend to destroy the bones over time. I mentioned that Victoria was close to the, the South Pole. And this is an, an artist interpretation of some of these small ornithopods. You have a couple of them in the animatronic dinosaur exhibit. Um, we believe that they had some form of insulation because it would have been cold, especially in the winter. Uh, small ornithopods have been found in China showing that they had some hair-like uh, filaments. Not, not quite like feathers. We haven't found any dinosaurs within the ornithischian groups, they're all, they're all plant eaters, that had feathers. But we think that some of them probably had some sort of insulation. Australovenator is the, uh, the by far best preserved of the meat-eating dinosaurs in, from Australia from the Cretaceous period was probably the dominant meat-eating dinosaur. You can see here the main feature here, the huge claws on the hands. So they would probably be the main killing tools, uh, whereas in a Tyrannosaurus, for example, had very tiny little arms, two fingers, but a huge massive head, so it would have used its jaws to kill its prey. But uh, Australovenator, probably not. Australovenator be belonged to a group called the Megaraptors, and they, it's based on a dinosaur called Megaraptor that was found in South America. And the first thing they found was these big claws. And initially, they actually thought that it was a raptor dinosaur and that those claws actually belonged to the toes. But then when they found more complete remains, they realized that that was not the case. Between Australovenator and the big sauropods they're finding in wind, and lots of sauropods, they are most likely of the same type, titanosaurs, as those making the, the sauropod trackways up in Broome. And uh, yes, one of the, that's all, one way of knowing that you have dinosaurs if you have trackways. This is from the Lark Quarry in Queensland. You can see numerous footprints here of small dinosaurs. Most of the footprints that we find up in brooms, they're really large, big whopping sauropod prints. But that's in part due to the um, environment where you find they are right in the, in the intertidal zone. So it's, it's more difficult for small ones or to spot small ones. They're more easily destroyed by the surf. Here's a typical big sauropod footprint. This is not from, from the Brunes sandstone, but from uh, France, I believe. This could have been a scene along the shore up at Broome. We do know that we have raptor dinosaurs because they they are finding teeth of raptor dinosaurs near Winton. And here you can see a big uh, titanosaur or similar sauropod defending its little one against one of these raptor dinosaurs. You can see the feathers there. Um, what did they use the feathers for? The, the wings were not big enough for them to fly, or they were too heavy. Um, one theory is that they used that huge claw to 
jump up onto their prey uh, like a small horned dinosaurs and dig in with their claws just like an eagle and just use the wings to keep the balance. Eagles do that and then just hold on till, they, uh, till their prey collapses or get by shock or blood loss. So it would be quite a slow and gruesome. The claws, they don't really have a sharp cutting edge, so they couldn't really use them to slice up the side of the, of the prey dinosaur. Here again, uh, it's me looking for dinosaurs. Uh, this is the right type of sediment. It's flood plain sediment of the right age, Cretaceous. But you can see that the sediments are quite pale, and that indicates that they're very deeply weathered, so we didn't find anything on that location. Um, this is an interesting bone that was lying, um, misidentified in our collections. It was found in the 1960s uh, at Jinjin, and it was misidentified as a marine crocodile. But um, a colleague came over from Melbourne, and he wanted to go through our collection, and he pulled out this bone, and he had a look at it, and hmm, it didn't quite look like a crocodile bone. So he handed it over to me, and I said, no, it, not quite. And we both thought that it sort of resembled pterosaur bone because it was very light and spongy. And pterosaurs had very spongy jawbone, whereas the jawbone of a crocodile is very, very dense because they're very powerful jaws. You can see here these are empty tooth sockets. So he took it over to Queensland and compared with better preserved material of pterosaurs. And this is the snout, part of the snout of a pterosaur found in Queensland. And sure enough, it turns out to be one of these. Uh, toothed uh, pterosaurs with probably a wingspan of four to five meters. So we had these flying across the other Perth plain 100 million years ago. It's quite amazing. And pterosaurs, they did not survive the extinction that took place 66 million years ago. They're quite, quite fascinating uh, animals. I would have loved to see one of those flying. And some of them were absolutely enormous. As you go from the early Cretaceous into the late Cretaceous, they were absolutely enormous. Uh, these would have been, some of them were as tall as a giraffe, and they were walking on their knuckles, and they would have had a wingspan of maybe 10 to 12 meters. And here they are portrayed as patrolling, looking for little baby sauropods, uh, like some modern birds do, or they don't look for sauropods, but they pick up lizards and other things. Uh, these are some of the outcrops where I did field work north of Calberry. You can see here we have a sandstone in the bottom, was laid down in shallow water 120 million years ago, and then we go up into deeper uh, offshore sediments where you find a lot of fish remains. And the right, horizon right here, we find bones of marine reptiles. We find bones of marine reptiles every time we go up there. And here's a volunteer. Uh, we often bring volunteers with us, and he's found this bone of a reptile called an ichthyosaur. And here's some even better preserved. These were actually found uh, near Gas Gascon Junction by an amateur. Amateurs are very important. They go out and they find fossils. And sometimes there's very beneficial, um, mutually beneficial cooperation between uh, amateurs and professional paleontologists. They are making the finds, they donate them, and in return they might get a species, na species named after them. They get to come along on field trips, etc. This is just an image to show you how the, these ichthyosaurs look like. So 120 million years ago, these would have been swimming along the coast here in Western Australia. We also found, on one occasion, a tail vertebra of a huge uh, animal called a pliosaur. These could grow to 10 or 11 meters, and would have been the apex predators. Um, one paleontologist estimated the jaw strength of Chronosaurus. According to him, uh, Chronosaurus had a skull up to three meters in length. According to him, they had enough power in the jaws to flatten a small car. I think he specifically mentioned a Volkswagen, a, a, small, <laughs> a small car. Very powerful jaws. Um, sometimes when you go out looking for fossils, vertebrate fossils, backbone from backbone animals, you know pretty much you're not going to find anything enormous. But you might be interested in looking at the, what, they, what the fossils can tell you about the environments. Here we are north of Calberry. You can see we have sampled here bed by bed. I did the digging and they were just sitting there. And <laughs> they were splitting the rock open, trying to find fish skeletons. So we wanted to see, this probably represents maybe 500,000 years. We wanted to see if there was a change in the fish fauna going up in time. 
that could indicate maybe that the uh, temperature, and maybe it's got warmer or colder, or a change in, in sea level. So it's part of the interesting detective work you do as a paleontologist, trying to go out and find evidence suggesting something about the environment, apart from finding new species. And here I have taken samples because I wanted to look at uh, fossil sharks material. Sharks, they produce a lot of teeth, so mostly you work on teeth if you work on sharks. You can see here I've sampled, taking a big chunk of this horizon here and filled my calico bags. And after sieving it back in the lab, uh, look at these beautifully preserved fish bones and fish teeth. Now they, these are 93 million years old. But they look just modern, apart from the colour. Exceptionally well preserved. Western Australia has some of the best fossil fish sites from the Cretaceous period found anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. Some of these layers are north of Calberry. I might find up to 1,000 fossil shark's teeth per kilogram of sediment. And here's just to show you how these fish would have looked like, an anchodontids. So they're quite common. Or very common. And at other areas, for example, in the Dralia range, you can walk what is effectively ancient sea floors. Imagine you're out walking there and you know you're walking on a hundred million years old sea floor. And sure enough, you have beautiful shark's teeth. This one is hundred million years, it's just recently weathering out of the rock. So it's some absolutely amazing fossil sites in Western Australia. And occasionally, if you're really lucky, you might come across a whole dentition of a shark, which I did in 1996. And it turns out to be a whole new family of sharks, the biggest sharks of the Cretaceous period. This one was found on Cardabia Station, so we named it Cardabiodon. Uh, this is just to compare with a jaw of a modern mako shark, two and a half meters long, so they were quite a bit bigger. And this is just some of the uh, creatures that we do find and that we are looking for. And obviously this is from a vertebrate paleontologist perspective. I've spoken exclusively of vertebrate fossils. But there are all sorts of invertebrate fossils, uh, clams, brachiopods, trilobites, a whole, a whole range of fossils that we have in our state. We have some beautiful localities yielding fossil plants down in the southwest, not too far from Perth of Eocene age, for example. So Western Australia has some really world-class uh, fossil sites. I think that was the last image, so I hope you enjoyed the talks and learned something about uh, fossils and the methods we use, uh, we and the ants, use to collect these fossils. So thank you.